Wanted to give a warm welcome to Eric Hoffman as he comes to share the message this morning. But World War II startled this generation by a dramatic demonstration of what a mechanized unit can do. And the church learned the lesson. It discovered that one lone missionary with a single piece of equipment oftentimes becomes as effective for God as a dozen missionaries. This, then, is the thrilling story of a great team. God, a missionary, and a piece of equipment. We understand when we look back over history that those who founded the Assemblies of God, when they implemented the programs of missions giving, they put something into place for every single generation. That the strength of our fellowship is that we are generational givers. Friends, we're here to witness one phase of Speed the Light, which is the missionary project of the youth of the Assemblies of God. What a witness this is to the world as to what young people can do when they're committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Speed the Light not only provides vehicles for missionaries, but along with printing presses and related printing equipment, transmitters and related radio equipment. We give so our missionaries can travel faster preach clearer and be heard louder in order for all to know Jesus. Students, through your generosity, transportation, communication, and compassion ministries are funded. Speed the Light is action, enabling the gospel of Jesus Christ to travel the globe. Your choice helps bring the light to children in war-torn countries and impoverished areas by providing vehicles to transport them to kids clubs and crusades. You give people in hard to reach areas a chance to hear the gospel. Your choice helps one missionary do the work of 10. From automobiles in Greece and Africa, to trucks in Togo, even camels in Kenya, to motorcycles in Vietnam. We are riding on Speed the Light motorcycles. These are some 90cc motorcycles that Speed the Light has provided that our, some of our executive officers have and our church workers and they take people everywhere. This is a little bit more of an incognito way of going, but thank God for Speed the Light. Speed the Light spreads the gospel. The reason we and you and I give to Speed the Light because we simply desire to spread the gospel. the light because speed the light spreads the gospel. Amen. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Man, so excited. I'm so excited to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, you know, have you ever felt like you, like you're on a NASCAR pit crew? That's what I felt just now. I was trying to set up back here, but uh, it's so fun, you know, doing this every weekend. Last weekend I was in uh, Whitefish, Montana the week before that, Sitka, Alaska the week before that, Yankton, uh, South Dakota. Traveling the globe is a blast, especially when you get to be a part of a program like Speed the Light. Okay, to think of this ministry, if you've never heard of Speed the Light before, which if you attend this church it would be hard not to, uh, but if you've never heard, if you're new here this morning, Speed the Light is an Assemblies of God program where students give sacrificially so missionaries can be provided with vehicles, communication equipment, and we partner with Compassion Ministries. And that it started with one man's dream, Ralph Harris, 75 years ago, when he believed that God spoke to him and said, what if you find 100,000 Christ ambassadors, CAs at the time, to give just $1 to a program called Speed the Light? People told him it could never happen, and yet that year, over $100,000 was raised, and the following year, more was raised, and the following year, more was raised, and now today we celebrate $322 million given by students and churches across our globe. All right. So let me just start by saying greetings from our general superintendent, Doug Clay. It is an honor and a privilege to serve him at headquarters and to uh, follow his leadership and to be led by him in such a way. His heart and his passion for the world and our churches is, is like none other. 
I'm excited to be here. I hope to represent Pastor Weaver's heart to you this morning. I got to meet him back in April, and I heard him speak at District Council when I was here for the event. And as he was talking, I look, looked at Adam Kolosik, who's a DYD. He's here this morning, and I said, I want to be like James Weaver when I get older. <laughs> like, I mean, that dude... Man, he threw it down. I love his passion. I love his heart. And immediately when he started talking to me about how he believes in this generation, the children and youth, and as a pastor and as a church, he wants to support and usher in and disciple them. I I mean, my heart was with him through and through. Uh, I hope he gets a lot of rest this week on vacation. He called me twice just to apologize that he wouldn't be here. But he told me not to worry because I would be in good hands uh, with Pastor Jeff being here. And uh, he actually said he, he was bragging on Pastor Jeff and saying that ultimately the church is in great hands, even looking forward in the future with uh, Jeff Hill at the helm as lead pastor. So you guys, man, yeah, amen. Uh, I, again, I travel nonstop. People are like, hey, what do you do? Basically, I get on one airplane after another, after another, after another, after another. And when I think I'm done, I get on another airplane uh, just in the past two weeks, I've been on 17 different flights. It, it's, been, it's been crazy. And they're like, hey, don't you have a family? Yes, I do. Um, and they are my biggest supporters, my biggest fans. So let me answer. I brought a couple pictures. Can I show you my family? So I have a 19-year-old son. Uh, his name's Matt. And this picture came because, you know, I did what any great husband would do on Mother's Day. I bought my wife socks with the pictures of my kids' faces on them. So I said, hey, I need a picture to do a gift for your mom. So he sent me that. I said, I said you're going to pay for that picture because I'm going to show it everywhere I go. <laughs> Typically, I walk into uh, youth, youth conventions, and I show this picture, and I say, hey, ladies, if you're 18 or older, I have applications for you to fill out today to marry my kid. <laughs> uh, but super proud of him. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you this. I'm, Matt was at, you know, as a youth pastor. He was in my youth ministry. And I spoke on purity one night, and he just took it to heart. And he said, Dad, I'm not going to kiss any girl until my wedding day. And I'm like, well, buddy, if you do that, I will pay wherever you want to go on your honeymoon. <laughs> he continues to remind me that I made him that promise and that he's holding out. And uh, he serves God faithfully. He's at James River College in his second year. Uh, he believes that God's called him to be a missionary. And let me just pause there for a minute. Uh, sometimes as parents, the hardest thing for us to do is when God calls our children to go for us to release them. This morning, some of your students, some of your own children may stand to their feet and say, I believe God's called me to missions. Okay, in the same way that Abraham had to lay Isaac upon the altar, God calls us to do the same thing. We aspire for our kids to be a lot of things, athletes, teachers, doctors. Okay, why not, why not inspire our kids to spread the gospel? Because ultimately, that's the most important thing we could do and invest in as parents. And I love that my son, he's like, Dad, he said, I'm studying. And I'm, I, so he's studying for ministry and business. And this is why the business side of it, this is where his brain's going, because he believes that he may end up being a missionary in a hot zone and have to go and undercover and start a business and be able to spread, a gospel, spread the gospel through business. So he believes that God's calling him to the mission field through business, which is phenomenal. And I'm praying that he would impact more lives than what dad ever will. Amen. And then the women in my life, I have three of them. Um, My wife Liz and I, we've been married 21 years. Uh, We do ministry together. She works for BGMC, Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge. Uh, We we bleed this thing, student ministries, missions giving. BGMC is the most important missions program in our churches. And some of you may be thinking, well, aren't you the speed light guy? Yeah, I am. But I'm telling you, it starts with our children, that if we could incorporate a heart of generosity in our kids, then they become children who give to speed of light, if generosity flows upward. So my wife travels. She speaks for BGMC. I was in Alaska. She was in Tennessee. It's just what we do. We love doing ministry together and apart at times. We have two daughters. Abby is 17. Uh, She's driving. She's almost to the point to where she is getting her license, Uh, not because dad's been helping her, because my advice to my daughter, when I'm driving in a car with her, I go on not many trips that I've been on because I'm scared half the time. (laughs) Okay, and she's like, Dad, why are you so afraid? I'm like, sweetie, you can't even push a vacuum cleaner without crashing it. (laughs) All right? 
So she'll get into the driver, she'll get into the, the driver's side door and she'll look at that and before I get into the car I get down on my knees. God, I know you have a plan for my life. You've called me to impact the globe. Please do not allow me the opportunity of death by the hands of my daughter behind the Amen. And she gets so mad at me, and I do it just to mess with her. I, I have a lot of fun with my kids. And then when we get to where we're going, I get out of the car, and I get back down on my knees, I thank God, and then kiss the ground that I've arrived safely. But no, but in all seriousness, she's doing a great job. I love her. She's so compassionate and tenderhearted. Um, and then Emma is 13. Uh, she, man, when, when you just know when your kids are going to be world changers. Uh, Emma, in three years for BGMC, raised over $10,000 by herself. Um, this past August in Orlando, she spoke on behalf of our general superintendent, Doug Clay, in a room full of 5,000 pastors and missionaries on stage with a microphone. And it was like, man, she had ice running through her veins. Like, there was nothing stopping her because when she gets up there, the Holy Spirit just ministers through her in such a way to where people are, like, it's just crazy to see God use your kids. And, and that's why it's so important for me to say to you this morning that if God calls them, then release them. Because there are people all over our globe that are just waiting to hear the gospel, and maybe just maybe God's raising up a new generation of missionaries to do it. Because really, that's what I believe God's called me into this position for. It's not to raise money for missionaries to have vehicles, nor communication equipment, nor to partner with ministries like World Service so I can come in here and say, hey, if you give 100000 it's going to be matched. That's amazing in and of itself. Because in that, that 100,000 match is coming from NFL athletes, NBA players, and businessmen and women from across our globe. Because I was at an event this past April, and in that room was Jack Nicholas Jr., okay, Doug Pitt, Brad Pitt's brother, uh, NFL football player at the time. He didn't retire yet, Chris Long. And I'm sharing with the room what students are doing across our nation to give generously to Speed the Light, how kids are writing out paycheck, out of their paychecks, giving thousands of dollars at a time for missions, and these guys are sobbing because they can't believe students are doing that for someone else. And Doug Pitt, it was Doug Pitt in that room on stage beside Chris Long who said these words, we're not going to let a bunch of 13 to 15 year olds out give us. Okay. And then Malcolm Burley, NBA players, sitting next to Charles Barkley in an interview, listen to me, only God can do this. In an interview, Charles Barkley asked Malcolm Burley, hey, tell me about your nonprofit, Hoops 2.0. Malcolm starts sharing how he's being used, used to, to provide clean water in Africa through water wells, through this, he didn't say ministry, through this company called World Serve. It's a ministry. And he said to Charles Barkley, he said, hey, Charles, you should give toward that. It, it, you could watch the interview. And Charles Barkley said, well, how much is it? Malcolm said 45000 and Charles was like, I'll write you a check for 45000 Here's what Charles Barkley does not know. That $45,000 check that he just wrote out to Malcolm Burley for Hoops 2.0 is coming directly to Speed of Light to provide water wells for people in Africa. So God, God continues to orchestrate this whole thing, Okay. I'll never forget at the age of 15, I started attending an Assemblies of God church. I uh, grew up Methodist. My mom's side, three generations of witchcraft. My dad's side, three generations of pornography addicts. But to me, my last name meant everything, Hoffman. I wasn't really afraid of my dad, even though I was. I was afraid of my grandfather. Lived in a small town, news got out. If I did something wrong, my grandfather always found out. Okay, I honored my last name. I honored my grandfather. So when I started attending the Assemblies of God Church, okay, man, I bleed AG. Like, I really do. And when I look at this thing called the Assemblies of God Missions Organization, our setup, our DNA, two core values, evangelism and missions, I wonder why people just don't do more of it. Okay, why is it that we look at this thing and we just don't cherish it in a way that we should? I'm not a pastor's kid. I'm not a missionary kid. I'm not a PK nor an MK. I am an HK, heathen's kid. I don't deserve to be doing what I do. There's nothing on this side of heaven that qualifies me to do it. And yet I honor what it is that we as a fellowship have. Okay? We have the opportunity to usher in 
the greatest missional movement the world has ever seen. That it's about generational missions giving, that, that BGMC gives our children the opportunity to give, that then they can step into youth ministry and have the opportunity to give through speed light and then world missions. But really, it's just not about missions because God's looking for us to be generous as a whole and to be faithful. It starts with our tithe. Everyone's like, well, wait, wait a second. You're going to talk to me about my tithe? Yeah, because missions given is not your tithe. Okay, it's above and beyond. It's a principle my wife and I had to learn. That it's that next level of obedience and faith. That God is looking for us to take care of home, storehouse, our 10%, and then do above and beyond. That this 100,000, this is the above and beyond. This is the extra. What I love about the culture in Africa is this. No matter what church I've walked into on that continent, no matter what country, when you go there, when they take the offering, every single individual pastor gives something. Every one of them. Whether it's a penny in our terms or a $100 bill, they all give something. Every children, every student, and every adult, from youngest to oldest, all get up, walk up, and give. Why? Because they honor what it is that God wants to do. And this morning, I I want us to think about the possibility. What if God could use us to be extravagant givers? This is already a giving church. But this morning, I'm not really interested in your money. You're like, well, you're taking an offering at the end. I get nothing from that. And that's not even why, when someone, a teenager asked me, why, why speed the light? I still don't know why God has me doing speed the light. Honestly, I have no idea what I'm doing. No clue. Still trying to figure this thing out as I go through it. I've been doing it for a year and a half now. Redneck Hick from Pennsylvania, my claim to fame is I can skin a deer in three minutes flat. My dad was a butcher. My grandfather was a butcher. Hard working. I worked on a farm as a kid. Like, I get it. Okay, I'm going to stick my hand to this plow, and I'm going to push as hard as I can while God's given me the opportunity to do it. Why? Because I truly believe that we're in the midst of the greatest missional movement our world has ever seen. It's just not words to me. Okay, I understand principles, and when I think of that, I, I think of this. From, from prison 500 years ago, John Bunyan wrote, author of the Pilgrim's Progress wrote these words. He said, the more he gave, the more he had. The more he gave, the more he had. And if we didn't understand kingdom principles, if you're new here, if you're not a servant of Jesus Christ, if if you're not living a life for the man who died upon a cross for you, you wouldn't understand this. But if you've grown up in church or if you've read God's word, you understand kingdom principles. The more he gave, the more he had. Okay? But to many, that, that statement's a contradiction. It's much like the English language when those, co- those from other countries who come here, when they start learning our language, it's difficult for them because some of the things that we say just truly doesn't make sense. They contradict each other. Sort of like these statements. Think of it this way. We say these words, a ship carries cargo, but a car carries shipments. We park on a driveway, but drive on a parkway. Okay. Why is it that our nose runs, but our feet smell? Okay, why do we give our money to people in finance who call themselves brokers? <laughs> when we're sick, we go to doctors, and doctors have practices. There's no egg in the eggplant, no ham in hamburger, and absolutely no pine nor apple in pineapple. Right? Have you ever thought about that? Con- things that we say that contradict each other. Jesus fi- faced similar situations like these. I want to share with you a portion of scripture to where Jesus and his disciples saw the same thing at the same time, but they came up and defined it in two completely different ways. If you have your Bibles this morning, Matthew chapter 26, starting with verse 6 this morning, it says these words, while Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, 
what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Jesus doesn't close out this portion of Scripture by saying, what she has done will also be told in memory of me. Jesus specific, and I love God's word because when you read it, when you take it in, God tells you exactly the words that he wants us to hear and to know. And he says, what she has done in this moment will be told in memory of her. By me talking to you about this portion of scripture this morning, I'm fulfilling prophecy. Here we are over 2,000 years later, and we're still talking about this woman. My fear, though, for the church today as a whole across our nation is that the church has become overcompromised and under-challenged. That when it comes to missions, missions has lost its meaning. It's a contradiction. What was it that Jesus saw in this woman that his disciples didn't see? Because his disciples immediately in verse 8 says, what a waste, but Jesus says it's a beautiful thing. They interpret it two completely different ways. And I often think, are there things even today, after serving Jesus faithfully for now 27 years, that I look at and I interpret the wrong way? Is it possible that I see what Jesus wants to do compared to what I think he should do across our globe and put my opinion into the mix and not refer to the word of God? When we think of the word missions, immediately the church often equates missions to money, but that's not really God's intent at all. Some will see missions as money, and others will see missions as changed lives. Changed lives. It's seeing what God is doing, lining up the pieces between water boys, okay, professional athletes, even through Free International, rescuing young women from sex trafficking here in the U.S. to see how right now Mike Bartell, the founder of Free, is being invited to all of the Major League Baseball stadiums to do strikeout slavery. And Speed the Light is rolling up on the scene in the vehicle that teenagers provided for Mike with the big logo on the side because God's using Mike Bartell to rescue women who are being trafficked here in the U.S. God is lining up and orchestrating all these pieces Why? Because we have an opportunity before us through missions to lead with such obedience that the gospel will go further into the future than what you and I ever will. So what's the intention? Well, God's intention is simple. Go, send, give, but our reactions have been come, stay, keep. How did we get so off track And I think it's coming to the season to where we, the church, through missions, we need to think differently. Not about projects, not about money, but about people. In 1997, Apple launched this commercial campaign and their new slogan called Think Different. In this commercial, it showed influential giants of our time that did whatever they could do to make the world a better place. It showed faces like Bob Dylan, Amelia Earhart, Frank Lloyd Wright, Muhammad Ali, Dr. King, Jim Henson, Albert Einstein, Picasso, and Gandhi, to name a few. And as these faces started scrolling on the TV screen, this poem was read in the background. Listen to these words. Here's to the crazy ones. The misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in square holes. The ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as crazy ones, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who actually do it. God spoke to me a few years ago to lead a movement. I was brand new as a DYD in Illinois. I had no idea what God was doing. And yet over the next three and a half years in our district, I saw Speedlight and BGMC giving increase 600,000 in three years. But more importantly, I saw students saying yes to the call of missionary. And then all of a sudden, I get a phone call from General Superintendent Doug Clay saying, hey, I want you to come to headquarters to talk to me about Speed the Light. Okay. Like, 
I don't deserve to be doing this thing, but I'm crazy enough to think that God could use me to change the world. Okay, the woman in Matthew 26 is one of the crazy ones because she took Jesus pretty seriously. And we need, we need to take him serious as well because he gave his life for us on the cross. And what was it that he saw in her that we should recognize this morning that the disciples did not? Well, first I think he saw that her gift had the extravagance of God written all over it. I love that word extravagant. Uh, traveling from the nations, I, all over the nation, I just check off my last state. Idaho. I've been to every state in the United States. I never thought this country boy from Southwest PA, I have an older brother and he hardly has seen any of the U.S. I have a sister who lives in Louisiana and she's hardly seen any of the U.S. Okay, but I've ticked off every single state in our nation. And what I can tell you is from the East Coast to the West Coast, from the North to the South, God's extravagance is everywhere. Okay, it's absolutely stunning. God is the extravagant creator. He didn't put just one star in the sky. He put 100 billion stars in the sky for you and I to enjoy. He didn't create just 100 insects. He spoke and 10 million species of insects came into being. 2,500 different variations of ants. 300,000 different species of beetles. God is an extravagant creator. In the U.S. alone, 5 billion birds and every single bird is different. Some can fly 500 miles nonstop. Some can fly 60 miles per hour. Some 100 miles per hour. Some even 180 miles per hour. There's over 10,000 different species of birds on our planet. God is the extravagant creator. Over 35,000 different species of spiders. How many of you would say, God, one would have been enough? All right. One that's, I mean, I'm laying in my hotel bed the other night, and I don't really get freaked out by spiders, but I'm laying there, I'm reading the Bible on my phone, and all of a sudden, you know how you just catch something out of the corner of your eye? And I look, and it's a spider crawling across my bed. All right. I realize my hand is bigger than most, unless you're in Costa Rica or Africa, because I've seen some big ones there, and in the name of Jesus, remove that. Over 28,000 different species of fish. We serve an extravagant God. And creation is God opening up his alabaster box for us. It's God saying to us to not be stingy. And none understood that principle more than Mother Teresa. In her book, In the Heart of the World, she shares a story from her time of seminary in Bangalore. And it's written that a nun says to Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa here in Calcutta you're, you are spoiling the poor. You are spoiling poor people by giving them too many free things. They are losing their human dignity. Her re response was, she wrote, when everyone was quiet, she calmly said these words. No one spoils us as much as God. See the wonderful gifts he's given to us? All of you have no glasses that are talking to me, but yet all of you can see me. What if God would take money for your sight? What would happen? Continually, we are breathing and living on oxygen that we don't work for or pay for. What would happen if God were to say to us, if you work four hours, I'll give you two hours of sunshine? How many of us would survive then? There are many congregations that spoil the rich. It's good to have one congregation that spoils the poor in the name of Jesus. The great reformer Martin Luther said, a religion that does nothing, that saves nothing, that gives nothing, that costs nothing, and that suffers nothing, is worth nothing. Jesus saw the extravagance of God all over this one woman's gift. And secondly, he saw that she gave until there was nothing left. And this is where things went awry with the disciples. Because during this time, custom was when someone came over to your house, you would have perfume to just put a little drop on them because they walked for miles, they had dirt on them. They carried just a little bit of an odor with them. So anytime someone would come in, the custom would be to put a little perfume on them. It would almost be like you have an Axe body spray at your front door. <laughs> hey, are you here for a visit? <laughs> right? It's like, come into my junior high boys' locker room. 
But she didn't do what was customary. She gave until there was nothing left. What the disciples saw as she poured out an entire bottle of perfume, in their mind, they began to equate its worth. And the worth of that perfume was nearly an entire year's salary. As she walked into the room and poured out onto Jesus, she gave an extravagant gift to Jesus. The problem with the church today is that we're completely okay with giving what's good enough, but many of us have no understanding of what it means to give until there's nothing left. We can't inspire the next generation and ask the next generation to give extravagantly unless we are willing to give extravagantly first. Judges chapter 2, verse 10, it's a verse that haunts me all the time. Every time I read it, after Joshua passed away, the generation after him knew not of the Lord nor of his ways. What's that mean when you think of that, that generation after Joshua? Okay, Joshua walked through the Red Sea when God parted it. That means that it just took one generation for them to stop sharing that story. Think of how quickly just things change in a generation. That right now, the graduating class of high school this year will be the first that was born the year that the World Trade Centers fell. Some of you can close your eyes and you can think of where you were at that moment immediately, but we're now we now have a generation of students that were not even alive when it happened. That's how quickly we gain or we lose a generation. For me, the goal is not speed the light, church. The goal is I'm looking 10 years down the road and I'm saying, how can we expedite the spread of the gospel 10 years from now? It's not about looking at tomorrow, but I'm looking at teenagers and I'm asking them, would you consider praying about giving your life? Because I think giving our money is easy. We don't have to be involved that way. We think it's such a big sacrifice. But it's given your life that is hard. This woman gave until there was nothing left. And the last thing Jesus saw was he knew she wasn't hindered by calculation. But she was motivated by love. The enemy of extravagant generosity are those that calculate its worth. They compute before they commit. They have to count the cost. So what am I giving up? What am I going to do? What's this going to cost me? How's this going to impact me? Instead of just saying yes immediately. The problem with the church is when the Holy Spirit speaks to us and we know we should say yes, we choose not to for fear of what others will think or how it will impact our immediate circumstances. Where are those that want to say yes immediately? That want to continue on with the blessing that's happening? You don't want to be number 56. Some of you are like, what do you mean by that? I'm going to share with you. Amsbury, Massachusetts, at a donut shop called the Heavenly Donut Shop, Eileen Taylor tells her story. Her husband just got laid off work. They were living paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. But one Saturday morning, she noticed that she had a small surplus built up. So her and her husband decided they were going to take their kids to the Heavenly Donut Shop to get them one dozen of glazed donuts. So they drive up to the drive through lane, they order their dozen of donuts, they pull up to the window to pay the cashier, and the young lady looks at them and says, you don't owe anything. The car in front of you paid for your donuts. Eileen says immediately she's flooded with this emotion, and she starts thanking God for the blessing that someone paid for her donuts, because God knew how short they were financially, that they were given out of the little that they had, that they had built up this surplus. And she said, immediately the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, it's not yours, pay for the car behind you. So she said, I listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit and I paid for the car behind me. And then all of a sudden the car pulls up to the window and the workers take on the story from here and they said, the third car paid for the car behind them. And the next car paid for the car behind them. And this was a small town, so word got out in the day of social networking these kids, come on, you know it. If you have a teenager in your house, and even us as adults, we never put our devices down. Okay, we're on Facebook, we're on Snap, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're posting, we're reposting, and we're posting again. Okay, they start posting on Facebook. What's going on at the Heavenly Donut Shop? All of a sudden, 20 cars in, the news station pulls up. It's a small town. This is big news. People are being generous for one another. They never even met these people. One of the teenagers working tells the story of 
a gentleman pulls up to get his coffee that he ordered, and they said, sir, you don't owe anything. The car in front of you paid for your coffee. He goes, well, I want to pay for the car behind me. They said, no, you don't. He goes, well, yes, I do. They said, no, you don't, sir. They got four dozen of donuts. You only got a coffee. He says, it doesn't matter. Someone bless me. I want to bless them. And this continues on until car number 56. A gentleman pulls up to the window. The young lady looks at him and says, sir, you don't owe anything. The car in front of you paid for your order. And he replied, thank you. And he pulled off. Let me just give you a disclaimer today. If you ever pull up to a drive through window and someone pays for the fo- your food, the person in front, please make sure you pay for the person behind them. Here's why. Especially if there's a teenager working at the cash register. You will be the subject of every social media outlet that is out there today. <laughs> you don't want to be that guy. And here's the deal, like car number 56, when it comes to missions, church, there's no room for us to be selfish. Absolutely none. And yet, we contradict a verse in God's word every single time we read it. Acts chapter chapter 1, verse 8. I'm all about last words. Okay, I can remember last words my grandmother spoke to me. I can remember the last words my great-grandfather spoke to me. These are the last words that Jesus spoke, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. We love that, ver- that part of verse. We all want power. People are hungry for power in our nation today. You will receive power, but the, the part that contradicts the church today is this, to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. We want power, but we neglect that the power that the Holy Spirit gives to us, the church is to be witnesses to the world. Do you hear that? And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you to be witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. Well, God, you know, I want the power to be a witness in my house, in my four walls, and and with my children, with my spouse. But what are you, you're asking me to do what? U.S. President Calvin Coolidge said that no person was ever honored for what they received, but they're always honored for what they give. I'm not after your money this morning. I'm after your life. I think it's something that we neglect to share with our churches, and hearing that your pastor has a vision for 25 people in 10 years, I hear that, and I say, what about 25 people this morning? What about 25 adults in this room who would say yes to the call of missionary, who would say yes to giving up everything and going, who would say yes to bringing hope to those who are hopeless, who would say yes to to help and provide clean water for those who are thirsty, who are dying, where the average age of an individual is 40 because they're they're dying of waterborne illnesses and dehydration. At the end of 2018, something came across my desk from Assemblies of God World Missions. It was their new brochure, and I opened it up, and I saw two words, and it completely rocked me forever. Those two words were spiritually lost, Those two words mean those who have either heard the name of Jesus and rejected. Some of you are spiritually lost in this room this morning. You continue to come to church and you continue to hear the word of Jesus, the name of Jesus, and you continue to live life the way that you live it because you just want to do your thing. Spiritually lost. Or those who have never heard the name of Jesus. I get frustrated when I walk in churches and I hear, I just can't wait till Jesus comes back. Thank you for being selfish. Because there's still three billion people on the globe that never even heard he came in the first place. This jelly bean represents a million people. And as I opened this book, I started to look at the seven regions of our fellowship. The Assemblies of God World Missions, we have seven regions, if you want to put that up there. And those regions are the U.S. and Canada, uh, Europe, next slide, Latin America, Asia Pacific, Africa, Northern Asia, and Eurasia. This represents the globe. So, for instance, spiritually lost one million people, every jelly bean represents a million. In the U.S. and Canada, there's a representation in the U.S. and Canada of 273 million people who are spiritually lost. In Europe, 517 million people. Latin America, 544 
million people spiritually lost. Region of Asia Pacific, 880 million people. Continent of Africa, 899 million people spiritually lost. Region of Northern Asia, 1.3 billion people spiritually lost. And then in the region of Eurasia, Two point six billion people people are Eric, why do you travel non stop i I have one hundred and ten segments already this year with American Airlines. I sacrifice a ton a ton of time with my family, but my family's all in because of this. Seven billion people on our globe that are spiritually lost. I just watched a a missionary video from Joel Marbot in Ecuador, and he shares a story of how through speed light, through sound equipment given, he was able to do a VBS this past summer to where thousands of children came to it. But in that crowd was an 85-year-old woman who accepted Jesus for the first time. And as Joel's telling the story, he says, she looked at me and she said, I just have one question for you. If, If what you're telling me is the truth about Jesus... Why am I just now hearing it at 85 years of age? Better question is, why haven't they heard it yet? I mean, we're trying, right? Grace, missional movement. Let's take for the U.S. and Canada, for instance, these jelly beans, one one jelly bean represents 10 people. So in the U.S. and Canada, we have 910 U.S. missionaries. So missionaries that represent ministries like Chi Alpha, Youth Alive, Chaplaincy, Teen Challenge, or Intercultural, 910, to reach 273 million people who are spiritually lost. It's one missionary to every 300,000 people. But the pressure shouldn't be just on our missionaries, because in our fellowship, the Assemblies of God, we have 13,000 churches across the nation, of which we have 38,000 credential holders, pastors, So that's 38,000 pastors plus 910. That means one to every 7,016 people. My son attends a church on Sunday morning, James River Church, where John Lindell speaks to 12,000 people every single week. As a matter of fact, if you break down the population of the U.S. and Canada compared to those that we say are spiritually found in the name of Jesus, the statistic comes out to one out of every four are spiritually found in Jesus' name not really bad odds when you think about Jesus shares a parable of seeds, right? And if you know the scriptures, you know this parable to where he says seeds are scattered on the ground. Some are immediately trampled on. Some are then eaten by birds. A third group takes root, starts to grow, but are strangled up by the thorns. But the fourth group grow and flourish and provide fruit, one out of four. But if we were to remove the U.S. and Canada off the table, we still have a representation of 6.7 billion people who are spiritually lost. Some of you are like, man, that's harsh. Well, we love sharing Luke chapter 10, verse 2, right? It's like our go-to verse. Okay, we need workers in the field, right? There's 6.7 billion people. We need workers, but we often don't share verse 3, where Jesus says, well, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. What's he saying? It's dangerous out there. Okay, you may die. And we have a representation of those who want to do that. 2,747 missionaries who have said yes to the call of missions to reach 6.7 billion people. But if you look at this number compared to these numbers, that's one missionary to every 2.4 million people who are spiritually lost. Statistically speaking, if you break that down, that's one out of every 17 Jim Elliott said, forgive me for being so ordinary while claiming to know such an extraordinary God. It's not about giving our money. I just apologize to you that for way too long, we haven't put missions before our churches to where we're actually living it out, where we're receiving power when the Holy Spirit comes on us to be witnesses to Eurasia, North Asia, Africa, Asia Pacific, Latin America, 
Europe, and the United States because we have lost people and unreached people groups here in our states. And you're like, where? Alaska? Out in areas to where you can't get to unless you're on a snowmobile or an airplane. They're waiting for someone to come share the gospel with them. Could it be you? Could it be you in Europe or Latin America or Asia Pacific and Africa? And the offering this morning that we're taking at the end of this, yes, we're going to celebrate that it's being meshed, but that's just a seed that you get to sow into a ministry that's being used to impact the globe. Could you be called to be part of that ministry? And through that, you get to be part of what God's doing through clean water in Africa. Let me show you this video as we get ready to close. Water is life. Having clean drinking water is something that most of us in the United States take for granted. At the turn of a faucet, you can rinse your dishes, take a shower, and make a refreshing glass of iced tea. But imagine life without clean water, where you have to travel hours on foot in the hot sun just to find a muddy trench filled with stagnant rainwater. Insects have laid their eggs in it. Your livestock drink from it. It is diseased with animal feces and urine, but it's the best you got to bring home to your children and family. Water determines quality of life. Water is essential. Water is life. And water is the vehicle which the gospel is being spread in Africa. Over the next few years, Speed the Light has made the commitment to spread the gospel through unconventional means. We are bringing physical water along with the living water of Jesus Christ to completely transform these desperate villages in Africa. Your Speed the Light money will make it possible for World Serve to strategically dig wells just like this one next to churches. These churches then become powerful oasis centers in which water provides sanitation, restores dignity, and changes lives for all eternity. Will you help? Speed the Light is calling you, along with thousands of students across America, to end the water crisis in Africa once and for all, bringing the gospel to the most remote places so that every person may find life in Jesus Christ. So the strategy I love with the water wells is this, that we're working with the missionaries on the ground we're picking the locations to where we have Assembly of God churches, to where the water wells are being placed on the property of the AG churches, to where people have to come to the church to get the clean water, and it gives the pastor an opportunity to share the gospel with them. It's genius if you think of it. Every well costs $50,000. This church, this weekend, up through next weekend, you could be a part of four, four water wells, four oasis centers, four opportunities for people who walk miles upon miles to get clean water to come there and not only find drinking water, but the water of life through Jesus. When you, when you give any offering at the end, that's what you're giving to. Some of you can pay for one of those wells by yourself. I believe that this morning. What do you want to invest in? I say it all the time. We invest in a lot of things that are good, but nothing that's really impacting the globe. Well, you give it away to where it will outlive you. But more importantly than your money, William Carey, missionary to India, said these words. I question whether all are justified in staying here while so many are perishing without means of grace in other lands. Maybe God's calling you to be the next Jacob Wilcox. God's looking at you and speaking to your heart. The Holy Spirit's saying, yeah, those purple, purple jelly beans, I'm calling you to go impact those. Yeah, see these blue ones here in Europe? Yep, that's you. I'm calling you to impact. The yellow ones, that's an area to where it's the hottest zone on our globe. If you really want to test things, go there. All right, 1040 window, that's where the most unreached people groups are because no one wants to go reach them because it's so dangerous. But the likes of Dick Brogdon is there. So could it be you this morning? 
You know your pastor's heart. 25 in the next 10 years. I'm saying, why not 25 this morning? God calls every one of you to say yes to Jesus. And if you haven't done so, I want to encourage you right now to evaluate your heart. It's the most important decision you can make to give your life, to surrender to Jesus, to let him lead and guide you in such a way to where you can go on the greatest adventure ever known to man. Jesus took you seriously when he died on the cross. It's time for you to take him seriously. But secondly, there's some in here that, you know the Holy Spirit's speaking to you right now, and it doesn't really matter how old or how young you are. Some of you are like, well, I'm retired. Well, you can choose to retire here, or you can choose to retire there. I just don't know what I'll do. I had a 65-year-old woman come up to me a couple months ago when I spoke about free international and sex trafficking, and she completely broke, and she was weeping, weeping, Zach, because when she was 18, she was trafficked. She said, I never told anyone this. She said, but for a year, I spoke I spent just on the road broken, being used and abused, and I know what those young ladies are going through. And if God could use someone like me, please tell me he can. Get me. So I sent her contact to Mike Bartell. I'm like, yeah, he can use you. Are you willing? You don't have to have the game plan. You just have to be willing to say, yes, God maps everything else out. So if you're here this morning, you'd say, Eric, man, that's me. I know God's calling me to be a missionary. Some are called to send, and others are called to be sent. Who in here this morning would say, Eric, you're talking to me. The Holy Spirit's speaking to me. I know I'm called. He's speaking to me to be a missionary specifically. I'd like like you to respond by just standing up right now, if that's you. Is there anyone? You know God's calling you as a missionary. Stand to your feet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Pastor, there's five out of 25. Uh, Six out of 25. Seven. You don't need to know the how. You just have to be willing to say yes. I'm just going to pause this moment. Anyone else? First service, I think we had four. We're going to up that number. So here's what I'd like to do. I don't want to take any more time. Thank you. Yeah. Stay standing. Don't sit yet. Don't sit. We're going to have people pray for you. Stay standing if you stood. All right. I just personally want to say thank you. Um, At the end of service, come find me. I'll give you my card. You can have my cell phone number. I want to be your biggest champion. I want to be a help, a support. I want to connect you to the pieces. I just feel God's put me in this position for this season to connect dots to raise up the next generation of people who can spread the gospel. So thank you for saying yes. And I want to ask those around you, if you're comfortable, would you stand beside them and just start praying over them? Just start praying with them if you're near someone who stood. Come on. Come on, church prays for each other. These are your missionaries who have committed to saying yes to the gospel. Father, I thank you and I give you praise for the opportunity to come to this great missional church. And God, we heard, your, we heard the pastor's dream of 25 and 10 years, but I'm believing, God, that that number could be 250. God, that you would awaken such a missional heart in this congregation, Lord, that they are immediately inspired to say yes to spreading the gospel to the outermost parts of this earth. God, that this would be, be the beginning of a fire that would be set ablaze within the hearts of your people. God, to where we know, we the church, we have to do something because there's seven billion people across this globe that are spiritually lost. God, that they would start here in this community. God, start being witnesses in this community where you have them planted. But God, you would begin to the process of launching them to the outermost parts of the earth. God, and we the church, we make the commitment to encourage, to lift up, and to support. God, to help them journey through this, to see to it that they end up in these regions where you've called them to go. We thank you and we praise you.